Hello, everybody, and welcome to On the Spot's Tem. Today, we're going to be tackling Yusuko 2019 January Silver Division. So, let us read the annoyingly long problem statement. From her pasture on the farm, Bessie the cow has a wonderful view of a mountain range on the horizon. There are n mountains in the range, where n is a number from when n is an integer from one to ten to the five. If we think of Bessie's field of vision as the xy plane, then each mountain is a triangle whose base rests on the x-axis. The two sides of the mountain are both at 45 degrees to the base, so the peak of the mountain forms a right angle. Mountain I is therefore precisely described by the location xi, yi of its peak. No two mountains have exactly the same peak location. Okay, very long, very annoying, let's decipher it. So, if we think of Bessie's field of vision as the xy plane, here is the xy plane, then each mountain is a triangle whose base rests on the x-axis. Let's first draw the base. So I'm just going to pick this random base because why not? The two sides of the mountain are both at 45 degrees to the base. Mm -hmm. And knowing triangles, the peak of the mountain forms a right angle. Okay. Mountain I is therefore precisely described by the location x, i, y of its peak. That makes sense. Given any peak, I can draw one and only one mountain. And no two mountains have exactly the same peak location. It's just saying that they're not going to be annoying and they're not going to give you two mountains with the exact same peak. Okay, so now we know what a mountain is. We know that a mountain is defined by its peak and that each mountain has its own base as well. Bessie is trying to count all of the mountains, but since they all have roughly the same color, she cannot see a mountain if its peak lies on or within the triangular shape of any other mountain. Okay, what does this mean? That means that if you have a triangle which is completely covered by uh, which uh, peak is less than the peak of another triangle or inside the mountain of another triangle, this means that it is obscured. You cannot see it. Another way to look at this problem is that you're given the mountain range and you have to find how many peaks are on that range. Okay, so well, we want to find out how many unique, the number of distinct peaks and therefore mountains that Bessie can see. Even though there are three mountains on this picture, Bessie can only see two peaks because the smallest triangle is obscured by another huge triangle. We can see that even if I remove this small triangle, we only have two peaks. And if I remove this one, we only have one peak. So now the input is given as uh, n lines containing xi comma yi, which just basically means that they're going to give us n mountains. And since these mountains are defined by a unique peak, they're just going to give us the peaks of all those mountains. And the output format is please print the number of mountains that best you can distinguish. Fair enough. So. Let's go through the sample problem. <laughs> okay, so here is the sample problem. They give us three mountains, and these mountains have the following coordinates, four comma six, seven comma two, and two comma five. And the sample output is two, which means that there are two peaks that are visible. This makes sense. It's very similar to the example I showed because this small peak is not visible. Okay, so now given the problem statement, how can we approach this problem? Well, a very important thing to look at Yusuko is to first look at your max complexity or what you can do. If you're looking at the problem statement, it gives us that we can only have, ten, we have 10 to the 5 mountains. Knowing Yusuko time constraints, this means that you cannot have an n squared solution. This would be too much. The n squared solution, which is very easy to see, is you compare every mountain with every other mountain. And you would do n squared comparisons because there's n choices for the first mountain and roughly n choices for the second mountain as well. And doing that, we could easily see which mountains are obscured or not because you're doing every single comparison. This gives us the option to either have an n log n solution or an n solution. Okay, so now that we've uh, eliminated the very, very easy solution, let's look into how we can define these mountains. 
So, let's look specifically into the condition of a mountain being obscured or not. We can check if a mountain is obscured or not, given that its peak is contained within another peak. This is sadly not a very nice way of evaluating this problem because that means we'd have to compare every single one. However, we can actually simplify this into a more common problem. We see that each mountain not only has its own peak, but each peak defines its own unique interval. Each peak defines its own unique interval because what is this interval? Let's just look at the math. Given a triangle with coordinates x, y, we know this is 45, 45, 90. Just because of what y means in this problem, this height is y. However, we can also use this to figure out that this is y and this is y as well, because these uh, halves of the 45, 45, 90 triangle form their own 45, 45, 90 triangles. And this gives us the endpoints of x minus y and x plus y. So we see that each peak can be reduced into x minus y and x plus y. And this will be very important later on. The next thing that we can see is for a triangle to be contained within another triangle, its uh, interval must be contained within another interval. This makes sense because if the intervals were not contained within each other, there would be parts of the mountain showing out, which would still be visible, visible to Bessie. So we can now reduce this problem to actually a series of intervals rather than a series of uh, peaks. This is very nice for the following reasons. Let's look at a sample uh, thing that I made for you guys to see. So this is a sample uh, mountain range, but you'll notice that instead of peaks, I've used intervals. I'm just going to draw it out quickly for you guys to visualize what this looks like, but I'm hoping this is straightforward enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can see that all of these can be reduced into just intervals and still have the same value. Okay, so how exactly can we use these intervals now to solve our problem? Well, this comes up to a very famous problem. This gets uh, reduced to a very famous problem where you actually look at the intervals and you see how many of these intervals are contained within other intervals. So, how exactly can we do this? Well, first, sort all these intervals by their start points. In this problem, the start points are x minus y. For an interval to be contained within another interval, both of its endpoints need to be contained as well, which means that x minus y needs to be greater than x minus y of the outer interval and x plus y needs to be less than x plus y of the outer interval. And uh, the one dot symbolizes the inner interval, and the two dot symbolizes the outer interval. Well, because the, the endpoint over here needs to be greater than this, and the endpoint over here needs to be less than this. This allows for a very nice comparison if we sort uh, the intervals by x minus y, because now, to, just ch to check the x minus y greater than x minus y condition, all I have to do is just check the positions. Obviously, the x minus y of this interval is going to be greater than the x minus y of this interval, just due to the nature of how sorting works. So, now all we have to do is check the x plus y is less than x plus y condition. How can we do this? Well, we, uh, the common way to do this for solver problems, which is very useful to learn, is note the following observation. Let us start with the first interval. After the first interval, I will jump to its endpoint. I can now jump to its endpoint because anything 
So uh, because anything that has an endpoint less than it must have been contained within that interval. Anything with an endpoint greater than it was not contained within specifically interval A. It might be contained within another interval, but not that one. So if I jump to the a end of A's interval, I can skip over interval B because this endpoint is less. I now jump to the next interval, which has an endpoint greater than A. This can be noted by interval C. C, because A, because A is done, B has an endpoint less than A's, and C has an endpoint greater than A's endpoint. This is our new endpoint. Anything with an endpoint less, uh, anything after C with an endpoint less than C must be fully contained within C. Let me repeat that. Anything after C, which means that its x minus y is greater than this x minus y, with an endpoint less than C, which means that its x plus y is less than C's x plus y, is contained within the interval C. This allows for a very nice procedure where we only have to scan through every single interval once. Let us continue doing this method. So, since we have scanned, it, since we have reached C, we now check for the next interval with an endpoint greater than C because that interval cannot be contained within C. We find D. This means that D is not contained within C. Now, anything after D with an endpoint less than D is contained within D. We notice that E is less than, uh, and E's endpoint is less than D, so it is contained within D, which means that the only visible peaks are A, C, and D. Let's go through this procedure one more time just to make sure that we know what we are doing. If you understand it now, you can skip and you can skip to the rest of it. So, look at A. You first go to A's endpoint. Anything after A with an endpoint less than A must be contained within A. So we go to B. B has an endpoint less than A and it is after A, so B is eliminated. However, the next interval C has an endpoint greater than A. Since it has an endpoint greater than A, A, is co A, uh, uh, A does not contain C inside of it. So C is the next interval that we're going to be using. Now, we're going to go to interval D because interval D has an endpoint greater than interval C, which means that it can definitely not be contained within interval C. Next, we go to interval E, but we notice that interval E cannot be used because of, it cannot be seen because of the fact that its endpoint is less than D and it is after D. Okay, so now we understand the algorithm. However, there's one edge case that we have to account for. When we are sorting by the start points, what if we have two mountains with the exact same start point? For example, given these two mountains, which one should come first? Well, our rule is that for, uh, like given a mountain, let's say we're looking at mountain A, all the mountains below it have the possibility of being contained within A. This means that given mountains J and K over here, we want to have mountain K come after mountain J, just so we keep that same possibility of any mountain after in the sequence has a chance of being contained in a mountain before in the sequence. Okay, so hopefully we understand the algorithm. Now we want to look into how to implement it. So taking out all this stuff over here. Okay, how can we implement this algorithm? There are, two, there are a bunch of steps to do. The first step is to sort. The next step is to uh, iterate. What do, and we'll go into each step in more detail. For the sort, what we can do is we can create a data type for the mountain. So we would have a data structure including x minus y and x plus y because these are the only relevant aspects of a mountain for us. 
we also need to have a custom comparator function. A comparator function would be able to, it would check the comparison between the x minus y, and in this comparator function you would also need to break ties between x minus y that are equal across mountains. And using this we can sort in an n log n method using the default arrays presented in whatever language, uh, default functions present in whatever language you're doing. And this should conclude the sort step. Now we need to iterate. To iterate what we do is we start at the first mountain and then we jump to the first mountain's largest endpoint, uh, to the first mountain's endpoint. From there what we do is we check for the next endpoint which is greater than the endpoint that we are currently at. This endpoint is less than so we would not be using this endpoint. This endpoint is greater than so from here you would jump to the next endpoint. Again this endpoint is less than so you wouldn't look at it and from here you would jump to the next endpoint. The number of jumps you do is equivalent to the number of mountains you have. And that is all we need to do to complete the solution for this problem. The actual implementation will not be pictured in this video but the most important part of a Yusuko problem is the algorithm and using this algorithm I'm sure that anybody with the sufficient coding practice can code up this. Thank you for watching our video and we hope that this shows you an interesting way to look at Yusuko 2019 January Contest Silver and specifically look at over, uh, overlapping interval problems in the future as well. Thank you.